Folks, welcome. We're back here, Ash 2023, beautiful city of San Diego, with the one and only Dr. Phil Scheinberg. Introduce yourself. Yes, uh, I'm Phil Scheinberg. We're in uh, San Diego. Beautiful day today. You're right. A lot but of. But we're here, like we're stuck. I know, but we're doing a lot of walking outside, so uh, we yeah. get to see a lot of the day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he shared with me he walked so far about close to 10,000 steps compared to the 1,000 steps I did. Right. So that means you need to catch up. I do. And uh, that's my goal, 10,000 for the day. So we still have another. Uh, yeah. 10 hours, so I'm good. I'm happy with my achievement so far. <laughs> I have to say that one of the things, I mean, so many abstracts, so much going on at Ash, impossible to cover everything. Right. So I'll give you that. Okay. But I'm sure there are certain things maybe have intrigued you and just made you pause and think a little bit in the area of interest, whether MDS, AML. Right. Uh, let's just maybe share with viewers a couple of teasers that will uh, uh, intrigue them to uh, follow along. So uh, let's start with one. So, you know, the, uh, so the myeloid neoplasia space has been uh, interesting because there's been, I mean, there's a lot of NGS, molecular data, prognostic care classifications, you know, which, are, which is part of what uh, is being discussed uh, uh, in these sessions, and uh, I, I've attended several of these. Uh, but I think one of the, in the therapeutic side, which is interesting, is that there's been some significant advances uh, uh, because you, you went through these MDS sessions over the years, and they, all they talked about was classification, classification, reclassification, more classification, because there's no therapy. Uh, but now there's therapy. So it's more interesting to go to these sessions because you can actually uh, get something more that you can bring home in terms of practical. So uh, low-risk MDS is interesting because um, uh, Luspatercept, which is a drug that's been presented at this meeting at a plenary session a couple of years ago, uh, now it's being developed uh, in earlier stages of low-risk MDS patients, which was compared with erythropoietin subcutaneously. So it was uh, with the COMMENCE trial that was presented by uh, Guillermo Garcia Monero uh, just yesterday. Uh, and that was very interesting because it showed a, 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 a higher effectiveness of Luspartacept compared to uh, epigen, which is uh, erythropoietin, which is highly applied in low-risk MDS in patients who have less than 500 or 200 serum level of erythropoietin. Now, Luspatercept actually did better in a randomized trial. So that, that really caught uh, uh, a lot of people's attention as a, a very interesting option uh, and, and how to sequence these drugs. It looks like giving a, an anti-TGF beta agent like Luspatercept early on is beneficial. Now, in the same session, there was uh, another uh, drug called Imetalstat, uh, which is an anti-telomerase agent. Not sure exactly how that uh, works, but in terms of mechanism of action, but that's what it does. Uh, and very good results in the low-risk MDS patients. Now, keep in mind that these are non-DEL5Q uh, patients, which is Revlimid, lenalidomide is the standard of care. So uh, th th these are very selected patients for which we don't have that many uh, options. You know, wanna just going back to the commands trial. Yes, yes, yes. You know, you hear a little bit about the comparative, the comparator arm. Yeah. Uh, is this is the comparator arm an arm where you would expect response to erythropoietin because they selected patients based on the EPO level and things of that nature? And, you know, as you talk to a lot of people, you know, say, okay, well, it's great. The experimental arm appears superior, but we kind of like, you know, the, 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 the patients that we select for the control arm, they usually don't really respond to erythropoietin. Yeah, that's a really good point. So this came out actually in the subgroup analysis where they actually looked at those patients that had a serum level that was right. you know, less than 200, less than 500, greater than 500. And e even in those groups of, the, of patients who you would expect uh, erythropoietin sub-Q to do well, like in those who had less, a serum level was, was lower, uh, in these, this subgroup analysis, Luspatric stuff actually did better. Even in those patients you would expect uh, erythropoietin to do well. So it, it did okay, so it had mm -hmm. activity, mm -hmm. it's just that Luspatercept had a better activity. Okay. So obviously... And the transfusion, the, because, I mean, we both can agree, requiring less transfusions is very important endpoint in patients oh, who are transfusion absolutely. dependent. So are these patients who are on the control arm normally respond to transfusion based on their EPO level and things like that? Yeah, well, they tend to be, do better if their EPO level is lower in terms of getting a sub Uh But again, because it's a controlled trial, you have the experimental arm and they did better. So it's, it, it, you know, it really sounds like, you know, that's not what the trial showed and that's not how it was designed, that you, you really want to combine these two agents. Yeah. But this is a different story. Actually, yeah. I was going to ask that. So we'll, we'll leave it till next time. Yeah. The, the last thing before I move to the next abstract, yeah. um, is there a way to simplify to our viewers 
how would they know a low risk from high risk MDS when a patient comes to clinic? Yeah, so, so that's interesting because there's a lot of the, you no, know, there's the IPSS, the IPSSR, the IPSSM. So many of these uh, reports, they, you know, they were done at a certain time. So in 2016, 17, you had the IPSSR, you didn't have the IPSSM. Uh, but they tried to actually put it into current classifications and, and try to see how this study would have fared out using modern IPSSM, for example. So yes, they were not designed that way, but you know they try to apply those newer classifications to see if the data still holds, right? Because you know you might be using an yeah. older classification, yeah. you know, especially with the inter intermediates, you know, because you know the, the the low risk tend to be they stay low risk, uh, and the high risk tend to stay high risk. The intermediates are the ones that tend to move more to higher to lower risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a really interesting point. Important study, randomized control, prospective in a practice patient changing. population. Yeah. Many have said this is practice changing. Yeah. What else can you share with us? Well, again, in the myeloneoplasma space, um, there, there were therapeutic-wise, there's in interesting in uh, the AML sessions, uh, Selenexor, which is a drug that's been approved in, this, in the United States for, you know. Myeloma. Myeloma and state, well, like, like advanced uh, multiple refractory lines of therapy now. And it has a modest activity as a single agent in that setting. Uh, very, a lot of toxicity. We didn't think it was we were going to see this drug in uh, in other areas, but it's been showing too. It's two oral abstracts with Selenex or either as a single agent or in combination with other therapies, uh, hypomethylating agents, chemotherapy. You know, that was this kind what, of interesting. In, is specific subtype of AML or? Well, no, all comers. You know, then they, they, they looked at subgroup analysis, looked at mutation to see if there was a group that benefited more than the others, uh, both in uh, adults. So it, it, it's interesting to see that this is a drug that's making its way uh, into a, the AML space in combination or in single agent and, and patients who had uh, failed other therapies. So, uh, so these are patients who had relapsed refractory AML and received uh, hypomethylating agents yeah. plus some Cell or or or, or uh, isolated by itself. So, um, so it's and, and it's actually there are studies even in frontline using hypomethylating agents with the uh, venetoclax and selenexor. So, so they're starting to move uh, forward. So it's been well tolerated. I was expecting more toxicity. Surprisingly, right? Surprisingly, I mean, you look at the myeloma data, right. you're like, wow. Nobody's got to tolerate this stuff. Right. Even uh, lymphoma data is a little yeah, exactly. tolerance of stuff. But apparently in AML, based on what was shown, it was it was okay so far. I mean, we have to see more patients uh, getting treated. But uh, the MENN inhibitors, which is another class of drug, that's another one that's been uh, also very, very high for KMT2A, KMT2A and uh, NPM1 uh, relapse refractory ML. Uh, you know, NPM1 is a favorable uh, genetic mutation, but when they relapse, they don't do well. Uh, or when they have persistent MRD positive with MPM1 detected by molecular biology and came to a very hard uh, ML to so treat. So the men inhibitors targeting patients who have There's the, two mutations. Yeah. The trials are looking at these two mutations, yeah. specifically which they tend not, not to do well. Uh, and, and how uh, often do we see these, like, just prevalence well, of... They're uh, very pretty common. I mean, they're not that infrequent. I mean, I would say between the two mutations, you're up to 20% uh, so maybe. Pretty, uh, yeah. You know, so it's... Um, it's um, it's toxicity, a toxicity. Well, it was very well tolerated. The differentiation syndrome is one of these, you know, side effects that you see with this. Uh, but again, it, it, it used as single agents, used in a combination with uh, hypomethylating agents and, and, and chemotherapy, adults, pediatrics. So it, it looks like it's going to be a very interesting uh, agent to uh, stay on the lookout for. Um, now, randomized trials are ongoing right now, you know, to see for registration, etc. But I, I, I think it's. You know, based on what we've seen in terms of the data, it's, it'll be it's tough to randomize. I'm not saying, I mean, we have to do them. Right. But whenever you have like a, an actual target and you have a menin inhibitor yeah. that is targeting that particular thing, yeah. it's so hard to decide what's the control arm and you yeah. kind of think like, it, it's really hard. Well, it's not It's not standard to use yeah. this, right? So you have to no, I know, tell I the know. patient and as of physicians, course. we have to be Absolutely. convinced Absolutely. that there's no standard, Absolutely. right? And it, this could work better than what we're doing, Which we don't but know. we don't know. And yeah. so we have to believe in it so we can pass this on to our patients. So yeah. if you don't believe in it, then, yeah. you know, but that's true. Well, you know, so yes, we yeah. don't know. Uh, looks the data looks very interesting, very well tolerated, makes a lot of sense, mechanism of action. But again, we have to see how when it when you have a controlled environment, how this uh, well, pans out. Phil, thank you so much. Well, we look forward to more data and seeing you again in the next uh, uh, few months at other. It meetings. was my pleasure. Can I go back to beautiful San Diego? Absolutely. Walk <laughs> twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. Okay. All right. Good to care. see you.